Jesus Christ and in time prophecies from the book of Revelation. A series of study from the Holy Scriptures based on the book of Revelation by Mark Finley. Join us as we follow the vital topics that will be presented on this study, understanding God's messages and warnings on this last days of Earth's history. Jesus Christ and in time prophecies from the book of Revelation. What does the future hold? Where can we find certainty in a world of uncertainty? The Book of Revelation provides hopeful answers for today, tomorrow, and forever. Join Mark Finley, author and world-renowned speaker, on a journey into the future with Revelation's Ancient Discoveries. Welcome to Revelation's Ancient Discoveries. Thank you so much for joining us on this journey through the Book of Revelation. Our goal for this series is really twofold, to discover Christ in all of his fullness, and all of his majesty, and all of his greatness in the book of Revelation. And second, to discover end time truths that will prepare you for the overwhelming surprise that's coming upon our world. Let's pray as we launch into this series. Father in heaven, we thank you for Jesus, and we thank you for Revelation, the last book in the Bible, that reveals to us Christ in all of his beauty. Enable us as we study this book to know you better, to understand your truths, and to be prepared for what's coming upon our world. In Christ's name, amen. My topic tonight is Revelation's startling predictions for the 21st century. You know, as you look around the world, scores of people are asking, what does the future hold? What really is in store for our children? Will this world be destroyed in a spinning globe of ash in some nuclear holocaust? Will we spend our last few moments clawing at one another for living space in a planet that's run out of food? Will global warming destroy the planet? This question, what does the future hold? is a question that is haunting thinkers around the world. And so millions of people who are concerned about the future are developing a new interest in Bible prophecy. Every place you look, people are not only asking the question about the future, but they're really looking for answers. Is it possible that there is some key to unlock the mystery of the future? Is the future dark and hazy? Or is there some key to unlock the future? Is prophecy real or is it just make-believe? Can anyone really know the future for certain? One thing is for sure, prophecy is a hot topic today. In fact, there are more than 50 million hits recently on internet sites that talk about Bible prophecy. Millions are turning to the psychics to discover answers to their questions regarding the future. But more often than not, they're being let down. More often than not, the answers that they're getting are leaving them empty, shallow, and afraid. One thing that you notice about the predictions of the psychics is they're predicting, predicting doom, predicting disaster for the future. Let me give you a few examples of prophecies recently by psychics, or really, it would be actually more accurate to say, ancient prophecies by seers. One is called the Great Pyramid Prophecy. The Great Pyramid Prophecy is supposedly finds a line through the pyramids that traces down the centuries, and this prophecy comes to this remarkable, quite startling conclusion. The Earth's magnetic poles show signs of becoming unstable, suggesting the beginning of a polar shift that will literally knock the planet off its ear, turning north to south and east to west in a matter of days. Not very reassuring, isn't it? Some prophecy that supposedly talks about Earth being knocked off its orbit and uh, the total chaotic destruction of planet Earth. Or take this Mayon prophecy. It is indeed an ancient 
prophecy. And uh, when you take a look at the Maon prophecy, many feared the world would come to an end along with the Maon long count calendar on December 21, 2012. So according to this Maon prophecy, the world supposedly was to come to an end December 21, 2012. Well, we're a few years after that, aren't we? The world still exists, unlike the failed prophecies and predictions of the psychics. The Bible has been accurate, can you believe it, for the last 3,500 years. The, the psychics' predictions often have utterly failed. They've left people in hopeless despair. But the prophecies of this book, the prophecies of the living word of God have been accurate generation after generation, century after century, millennium after millennium. And you can take the prophecies of the Bible and here you find hope, here you find confidence, here you find courage for the future. Somebody says, what is the evidence of that? Well, in scripture, there are at least 800 prophetic verses. 90% of those prophetic verses are already fulfilled, and 10% of them will be fulfilled in the very, very near future. That's a pretty good track record, isn't it? 90% of the prophecies that have already been predicted in scripture are fulfilled, 10% dealing with the future that'll be fulfilled in the very near future. And the interesting thing about these prophecies of the Bible is these prophecies speak of hope. These prophecies speak of courage. These prophecies speak of a brighter future, far brighter than you could ever imagine. Fulfilled prophecy verifies the truthfulness of God's word and it gives us confidence that the future is not in the hands of man, but the future is in the hands of the living God. Isaiah chapter 46, verse nine and 10 puts it this way. Remember the former things of old, for I am God and there is no other. I am God and there is none like me. Now what is the evidence that God is God? What is one of the greatest evidence that God is divine? What is the, one of the greatest evidence that God indeed is separate from any other of the false gods? Isaiah said this to Israel and the prophecy certainly applies to you and me. Here's what he says. Declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times things that are not yet done. So one of the greatest evidences that God is God is the, his ability to declare the end from the beginning. Did you get that? What's the evidence everybody? What's the evidence that God is God? What can he do? Say it with me. He can declare the what? That's right. He can declare the end from the beginning and from what? Ancient times, things that are not yet done. So the ability of God to foretell the future is one of the greatest evidences indeed that he is God. In 2 Peter chapter 1 verse 19, we have this assurance. And so we have the prophetic word confirmed, which you do well to heed as a light that shines in a dark place until the day dawn and the morning star rises in your hearts. So prophecy is like a light. It shines on the future. It tells us what is to come. Now the reason prophecy is so significant, and particularly the book of Revelation, is not simply because a light shines on the future to satisfy our intellectual curiosity. The reality is that prophecy has a very practical purpose. It enables us to know what's coming so we can prepare for what's coming. It enables us to know what's going to take place in the future so that we are able to be ready for those events. So Jesus, specifically in the book of Revelation, shares with us events that are yet to unfold to prepare us for those events. So let's go to the book of Revelation. Revelation reveals God's final message for humanity. 
It is the last book in the Bible with the last message for human beings on planet Earth just before the coming of Christ. Now, there are those people that say, well, Revelation is kind of a closed book. It's a book of mystic symbols. It's a book of prophetic images. How can you really understand it? I remember not long ago, I was teaching a course on Revelation, and a man came to me and said, I, I always have hesitated in studying Revelation because it really frightens me. It really makes me afraid. But then he said, Pastor Mark, after I've gone through your meetings on Revelation, I have new hope and I have new courage. See, Revelation does not mean a ceiling. Revelation does not mean something that's closed. Revelation means a revealing or an unfolding. So when you think about the book of Revelation, it's not that God is trying to hide the future from us. It's rather that God is revealing the future in Revelation. Now somebody says, I wanna study about Jesus. I don't wanna study about Revelation. Let's go to Revelation chapter one, verse one. The revelation of Jesus Christ. Who is this a revelation of? The revelation of Jesus Christ. It is Jesus' revelation. Where did he get it? Which God gave him to show his servants things which must shortly take place. And he sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant John. Now let's dissect this verse a little bit. Let's look at it. Let's look carefully at Revelation chapter one, verse one. Notice what the scripture says. It says that the book of Revelation is the revelation of Jesus Christ. Down through the centuries, believers that have been persecuted, believers that have faced the sword, fire, death, and even crucifixion itself, believers who have been severely beaten and oppressed have found courage and hope in this book. Why? Because it's the revelation of Jesus Christ. It is Jesus' revelation, not only to an end time people, but Jesus' revelation of his triumph over the principalities and powers of hell down through the ages. Now, if you want to understand the basic theme of Revelation, here is a Revelation course in four words. Are you ready? Revelation course in four words. There may be things you don't understand about Revelation, but if you understand these four words, you'll understand the book of Revelation. Here it is. Jesus wins, Satan loses. What is it, everybody? Jesus does what? Jesus wins and Satan loses. That's the great theme of the book of Revelation. Revelation 22, verse 20, puts it this way. Revelation 22, rather, verse 10, says this. And he said to me, do not seal the words of the prophecy of this book, for the time is at hand. So is the book of Revelation a sealed book, is it? Do not do what? Seal the prophecies of this book, for the time is at hand. So the book of Revelation is not a what? It's not a sealed book, it is an open book. It is the revelation of Jesus that God gave unto him to show his servants things which must shortly come to pass. The Christ who gave the revelation gave it to us because he wants us to understand it. Let me ask you this question. If Jesus is the author of Revelation, and if Revelation is the last book in the Bible, would you not think that Christ wants us to understand this vital book, this last book of the Bible? Certainly, he would. Revelation assures us that the kingdom of God will triumph over all of wickedness. That is the great theme of Revelation. In every chapter of Revelation, Jesus is triumphant. Jesus does not lose one battle in the book of Revelation. Things may seem to be oppressive, they may seem to be difficulty, difficult, but Jesus Christ wins. Revelation 1 verse 1, let's go back to it. It is the revelation of who? It's the revelation of Jesus Christ. And where did he get that revelation? God gave it to him. Now notice the sequence here. God gives to Jesus the message of revelation. There's a message for end time, a message for God's last day people born in the heart of God. He gives it to Jesus. Jesus then does something with it. What does he do with it? He sends and signifies it by his what? angel. So there's a message born in the heart of God. That message from the very heart of God is given to Jesus. Jesus gives it to the angel. And what does the angel do with it? He gives it to John. And John writes it down on the island of Patmos. John writes at the end of the first century. 
And as John writes at the end of the first century, he's there isolated on the island of Patmos. He is there on that Patmos island for his faith in Jesus Christ. The Emperor Domitian wanted to silence John's voice. And history tells us that he was burned in a cauldron of oil there on the continent in Rome. But he was unaffected. And even his tormentors were amazed as God miraculously protected him. Domitian wants to silence his voice. It's in the end of the first century. John is exiled on the island of Patmos. And there, separated from family, separated from friends, there at his time of greatest tribulation, that island of Patmos is illuminated with the glory of God. And heaven's message comes and speaks to John. And John writes it down. In the midst of your tribulation, in the midst of your difficulty, in the midst of your heartache, isolated at times from family, or friends, God is going to come and speak to your heart. God's going to give light to your soul. God is going to minister to you. There are times we go through difficulties, difficulties in our marriage, difficulties with our families, difficulties with our children, difficulties with our health. And sometimes, like John, we feel so isolated and alone when the darkness engulfs us. But yet Christ comes. Christ comes and gives us reassurance. Christ comes and gives us hope. Christ comes and gives us confidence. That's the message of the book of Revelation. John, on the island of Patmos, has an amazing vision of the future, and that brings him hope and courage. The revelation of Jesus Christ, the same Jesus that walked and talked the dusty streets of Galilee, the same Jesus that broke the bread and fed 5,000, the same Jesus that touched the eyes of the blind and they were opened and the ears of the deaf and they were unstopped, and the same Jesus that healed the leper. This is the Christ of the book of Revelation, the same Jesus that prayed for the world in the Garden of Gethsemane, the same Jesus that said, Father, not my will, but thy will be done. It is this Christ, this Christ, that's the Christ of Revelation. He is the Jesus whose hands were stretched out on the cross for you. He is the Jesus who was nailed to that wooden bar for you. In the book of Revelation, Jesus, the Lamb of God, is mentioned over 25 times. He is the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world, Revelation chapter 13, verse eight. He is the lamb who's able to open the scroll, the bloody lamb, and provide salvation for all humanity, Revelation chapter five. He is the lamb of God who triumphs over the dragon and the powers of hell in Revelation, the 17th chapter. This is the Christ of the book of Revelation. This book of Revelation focuses on one major event. It focuses on the return of our Lord. You remember the disciples as they watched the lingering glory of Christ as he ascended into heaven. And the angel said, you've seen Jesus go up into heaven, but this same Jesus will come again. This same Jesus you've seen ascend will descend. That's the very theme of the book of Revelation. This longing, this aching longing for the return of Christ. Now the Bible tells us in Revelation 1 verse 3, blessed is he who reads and those that hear and blessed are those that keep those things that are written in it. So there's a triple blessing. What's the blessing? The blessing for those that read. So together. As we journey through this series, Revelation's Ancient Discoveries, and as you with me are reading from the screen, what are you gonna receive? What's the Bible say? A blessing. What, when will you be blessed? When you read and as you hear, as I unfold the prophecies of Revelation, you will be incredibly, amazingly blessed. But the reason to read and to hear is not just to store facts in our mind, it's not just to keep something deeply inside. It's to keep those things that are written therein. So these prophecies will call you to action. These prophecies will stimulate the desire 
to make changes in your life. So be prepared to make some changes. As God speaks to you, be prepared to be open to his spirit as it moves in your heart. Are you open to his spirit tonight? Are you open to his spirit today? Are you willing to say, Jesus, as we study the book of Revelation, whatever you want me to do, I'm gonna do that. Jesus, as we study the book of Revelation, I'm your man, I'm your woman, I'm your boy, I'm your girl. And Lord, whatever you ask me to do, I don't only wanna read to fill my head with some intellectual curiosity. I don't wanna only hear the book of Revelation. I wanna keep it. Lord, place within my heart a desire to do exactly what you say. As I read truth from your word, may that truth be so powerful. May that truth be so life-changing. May I be willing to follow that truth. In the book of Revelation, Jesus is Revelation's alpha and omega. In Revelation, Jesus is Revelation's true and faithful witness. In the book of Revelation, Jesus is the light of the world. He is the one that illuminates this world's darkness. In the book of Revelation, Jesus is the all-powerful creator, the one who spoke and worlds came into existence, the one who carpeted the earth with living green, the one who flung the sun, moon, and stars into space, the one that created the animals and the one that fashioned Adam and created Eve from his rib. In the book of Revelation, Jesus is the all-powerful creator, and if he can create a world he can recreate your life he can make you over again into his very image Jesus is Revelation's dying lamb and as we mentioned over 25 times Christ is mentioned as the lamb in the book of Revelation in Revelation Jesus is Revelation's righteous judge you know in this world there are things that are time that are unjust and unfair and one of the great questions that many young people are asking, many of the millennial generation, is this. If God is so good, why is the world so bad? In the book of Revelation, Jesus is revealed as the righteous judge that will set all things right. The one who is incredibly fair. Life may be unfair. Bad things may happen to good people. But one day Jesus is gonna sit on his, sit on his throne. And one day, he will set everything in your life that has gone wrong, Christ will set it right. But in Revelation, Jesus is the coming king. He is the ultimate solution to the problems of this world. He is the one that can usher in peace and joy and happiness and meaning and purpose, a land where there is no cancer, or heart disease, sickness, suffering, heartache, death, or war. This is the Christ of the book of Revelation. Now, in Revelation chapter one, this, the chapter that we're studying, especially in our introductory program here, Revelation's Ancient Discoveries, the scripture says in Revelation one verse four this, Grace to you in peace. So the book of Revelation is a book about what, everybody? Grace. What else? Peace. Grace and peace from him who is, who was, and is to come. So Jesus, three things about him. Jesus is, Jesus was, and Jesus is to come. Jesus was. He is the all-powerful creator. The Bible says that all things were created by him. So Jesus preexisted from eternity with never a beginning and he'll never have an ending. He is the eternal Christ. He was there in Eden as the active agent of creation with the Father, Jesus was. Jesus existed down through the millenniums after Adam and Eve sinned. Jesus was born as a babe in Bethlehem's manger. Jesus was, he lived that perfect life that you and I should have lived. And Jesus died the death that we should have died. He, Jesus was, and then the Bible says, Jesus is. What does it mean that Jesus is? Grace to you and peace, Revelation 1, verse four. From him who is, who was, and who is to come. Jesus is. You know, I've traveled the world, and I've stood there at the 
tomb of Stalin in, in Red Square. And here he lies in his, rather Lenin's tomb in Red Square. And uh, Lenin lies in his tomb. And you see his embalmed body by the, by the Russians. But yet Lenin, that leader of the former Soviet Union who had power of millions, is dead. Or I've been in Beijing and, and saw the mausoleum of Chairman Mao. He is dead. You think of the great leaders of this world. They have lived, they've been on the scene, and they died. But Jesus is. The Bible says that Christ is alive. The tomb of Christ is empty. He's resurrected from the dead. When the Father said, son, come forth. Thy Father calleth thee. Jesus came out of the tomb with new glorious life. Jesus, according to the book of Revelation, is and because he is. The Bible says that he stands in heaven for you and me. Not only is Christ there, but Jesus is to come. He was, he is, and he is to come. He's gonna stream down the card of the sky. As lightning flashes from the east even to the west, so shall the coming of the Son of Man be. One day the earth will shake. One day the buildings will tumble. One day every mountain and island will be knocked out of their places. One day Christ will come. And that is the great theme of every prophecy. That is the great theme of every chapter of the book of Revelation. Revelation 1 verse seven. Can you read it with me from the screen? Let's read it together. Revelation 1 verse seven. Behold, he is coming with clouds and every eye will see him. The eyes of the young and the eyes of the old. The eyes of the educated and the eyes of the uneducated. They're the eyes of South Americans and the eyes of Africans and the eyes of Asians and the eyes of North Americans and the eyes of men and women around the world will see him when he comes. Now notice the Bible does not only say the righteous eyes will see him when he comes. Notice what scripture says. Behold, he's coming with clouds and what? Every eye will see him. Now, every eye is every eye, because if every eye weren't every eye, it would be some eyes, and some eyes aren't every eyes, and every eye is not some eyes, right? Every eye will see Jesus when he comes. He came as a babe in Bethlehem's manger once, and only a few recognized him. When he comes again, every eye is gonna see him. Now, Revelation gives us hope and courage to face tomorrow, because in spite of earthquakes, in spite of tsunami disasters, in spite of hurricanes, in spite of famines and fires and floods, in spite of worldwide terrorism and, glowing, and global warming, in spite of all of that, Jesus Christ promises that he will come again. Every chapter in the book of Revelation describes this glorious, amazing event of the coming of Christ. In Revelation chapter five, where you have the opening of the seals, we notice again in Revelation chapter five that it is really the introduction of the opening to the seals. The opening of the seals come a chapter later. And, uh, but in Revelation five verse 13, you have this introduction to the opening of the seals. And notice how it ends. The Lamb of God is opening the seals and he says, blessing and honor and glory and power be to him who sits on the throne and to the lamb forever and ever. Now notice, there is praise to the one that sits on the throne. This does not seem like victory to the beast, does it? This does not seem like victory for the evil one. Here is the triumph of Jesus Christ. Blessing and honor and glory and power be to him who sits upon the throne forever and ever. We come to Revelation, and we're looking there at chapters six and seven. And as these seals are open, after that introduction in Revelation chapter five, you have four horsemen that gallop across the earth. There's the rider on the white horse, the rider on the red horse, the rider on the black horse, and the rider on the pale horse. Now we're gonna study these things in quite a bit of detail as we come to 
the chapters in Revelation regarding these horses. So we're gonna go over this in very, very specific detail. But today, here's what I want you to see. I don't wanna look at so much the details, but I want you to see the end game. What's the end game? In these chapters, the white horse symbolizes the purity of Christianity. Then you go to the red horse, a blood-stained faith. The black horse, a compromised faith. The pale horse, we're gonna study it in detail later. But I want you to see how this chapter ends. Notice Revelation 7, verse 14 and 15. These are the ones, so at the end of the seals, how does this whole story end? These are the ones who come out of great tribulation. Therefore, they are before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. So whatever happens down through history in the opening of these seals, no matter what happens in persecution, no matter what happens in trial, no matter what happens in difficulty or heartache or sorrow, something goes on. Jesus Christ is triumphant. Jesus Christ is glorious. And at the end, his people who come out of great tribulation they serve him day and night in his temple. Here is the incredible good news. Jesus wins and Satan loses. Here is the incredible good news. Christ indeed is triumphant. Revelation chapter eight, Revelation chapter nine deals with the trumpets. Somebody says, I've read those before. I can't make sense out of those trumpets. It, it seems like there's so much bloodshed and the earth is destroyed. And I, I just don't, can't make any sense out of that at all. Don't worry right now about the individual details. Look at the end game. How does this whole thing about the trumpets end? Again, the theme is Jesus wins, Satan loses. Look, Revelation eleven fifteen. 15, at the end of the trumpets, it says this, the kingdoms of this God have become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever and ever. You see, again, the book of Revelation is not some book of mystic symbols, not some book of scary images, not some book of, uh, of beasts that frighten us. Sure, those things are in Revelation. But the key theme of Revelation is the triumph of the kingdom of God. A number of years ago, when our son was just very, very small, my wife took our son Mark to get a haircut. While they were in the barber shop, she noticed that there was a man sitting in the barber chair reading a newspaper. As he was reading that newspaper, he said, you know, the things in the newspaper are scary. You read about crime, you read about riots, you read about terrorism, you read about global disasters. You know, I, I almost can't even read the newspaper anymore. It's just too scary. The barber, young man, said, hey, sir, you think the newspaper's scary. You should try to read the book of Revelation. Because when you read the book of Revelation, that will scare you out of your wits. I tried to read it the other night and I saw those great beasts and all it did was frighten me and it scared me half to death. My wife overheard that conversation. She came back home and she said to me, Mark, go get a haircut. I said, but honey, what do you mean? She said, the, the barber, he is interested in the book of Revelation and uh, if you go to get a haircut, you can talk to him about Revelation. I said, darling, do I really need a haircut? She said, I don't know if you need a haircut or not, but you better go down and talk to that barber about Revelation. So I went down and she said, now there are three barbers. There's a woman on the right, you don't want her. There's a guy, old guy in the center, you don't want him. But there's that young guy with long hair. He's the guy that was reading Revelation and he's quite scared about it. Why don't you go and talk to him about Revelation? So I went down, faithful husband, dutiful husband, went down and uh, sat there and I began praying, Lord, help me, help me to get the right barber. The girl came to me and said, sir, you're next. I said, no, no, I'd like that barber over there. Do you know him? No, but, but I've got a good recommendation. Um, the old guy comes, do you want a haircut? No, no, I don't want that guy over there. So pretty soon I go and I had been praying, so I picked up the newspaper and I started reading the newspaper. I read the newspaper. Boy, you know, sir, everything in the newspaper is scary. I mean, there's terrorism, there's global warfare. 
And immediately the guy got a big smile and he said, you should see Revelation. I said, but you know what your problem is? You never read the end of the book of Revelation. And that's why it's scary to you because you've never read the end of the book of Revelation. But you read the end of it. And the end of that book of Revelation is an amazing book. Revelation eleven fifteen. let's look at it again. The kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and he is Christ and he shall reign forever and ever. The barber said to me, uh, do you know anything about Revelation? I said, well, I read it a few times. I read the end of it. And you know, at the end of it, there's no more sickness, suffering, death, heartache, or war. He said, boy, that doesn't sound like this scary stuff. He said, would you share some things with me in Revelation? I said, I'll make an agreement with you. You cut my hair free and I will uh, teach you the revelation free. You say, Pastor, did you do that? Well, you know, I'm, a pet. No, I'm teasing you a little bit, but we had a good time with the barber. He began coming to my home, and we began studying the Bible together. We looked at revelation. A new peace flooded into his life. A new joy flooded into his soul. It's amazing what Christ did in that man's life. As I saw Jesus touch him, I had to travel a great deal, so I'd loan him tapes and DVDs in those days, in tapes in those days, but DVDs today. We'd loan him DVDs and he would uh, look at the material and uh, he would be just so absolutely thrilled. Eventually, this barber came to Jesus Christ. Eventually, we saw him change his entire life, and I had the privilege of seeing him go into the water and being baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. You see, Revelation need not be a scary book to you. Revelation is a book that's filled with hope. Take Revelation chapter 13 and 14. You say, oh, Pastor, I, don't go there, don't go there. You remember Revelation 13 and 14, it says, and I, Revelation 13 starts this way, and I saw another beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his heads ten crowns, and upon the crowns the name of blasphemy, and the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard, his feet were like the feet of a bear, his mouth was like the mouth of a lion, and the dragon gave him his power, his seat in great authority, and all the world wondered after the beast. Pastor, the beast power of Revelation 13. Isn't there someplace in the Bible that talks about an economic boycott where nobody can buy or sell? Wouldn't you be frightened to live through that time? Isn't, isn't there someplace in the Bible that talks about Revelation 13 uh, that there's a death decree that's gonna be passed? Pastor, doesn't that frighten you? It depends where you're looking. You see, if you're looking at all the problems of this world, if you're looking at all the difficulties of this world, if you're looking at all the heartaches of this world, if you're looking at your weakness rather than Christ's strength, if you're looking at your frailty rather than Christ's enduring might, if you are looking at yourself, there is no way that you're gonna get through that great time of trouble. But if you are looking at Jesus Christ, if your heart is anchored in Christ, you know, I love the way that scripture puts it. In, in Psalm 46, God is our refuge in strength, a very help in what? Trouble. Therefore will not we fear, though the earth be removed and the mountains carried into the midst of the sea, though the waters shake with the swelling thereof, the stream thereof, make glad the city of God. God is in the midst of her and she shall not be moved. God shall help her in every right early. You see, the earth is gonna shake. There will be traumatic times ahead, but our God is greater than any difficulty. Our God is greater than any challenge. Psalm 91, a thousand shall fall at thy side and 10,000 at thy right hand, but it shall not come nigh thee because he shall give his angels charge over thee that'll keep thee in all thy ways. Get your eyes off the trauma. Get your eyes off the beast and put it on Jesus Christ. Get your eyes off the time of trouble and focus them beyond on heaven and the glory of heaven and the glory of eternity as you do that. New hope will fill your heart. New courage will fill your life. New joy will fill your being. It depends on where you're looking. Looking at yourself, there's only weakness and frailty. Looking at others only will make you critical. Looking 
at the trauma in the ahead and the difficulty and the challenge. You know, I've talked to some people. They have all these sophisticated time charts. They talk all about these events that are coming, and some of that is okay. We need to be children of light and not children of darkness. But if that is your focus instead of Jesus Christ, you will feel such weakness and fear. I've had young people that say, I can't, I can't think about the future because I'm so afraid. Well, don't focus on it. It's important to know what's coming. Jesus said, you're children of light, not children of darkness. But that is not our focus. Our focus is on the strength that there is in Jesus Christ. Revelation chapter 14 summarizes that message of the beast power in Revelation 13. And what happens at the end of Revelation 14, verse 14 and 15? Here it is. Then I looked, and behold, a white cloud, and on the cloud sat one like the Son of Man. Now notice, I looked, and behold, a white cloud. What does John say? He says, I'm looking. Not looking at the beast. Not looking at an economic boycott where no man can buy or sell. Not looking at the death decree. Then I looked, then I looked, then I looked, and behold, what a white cloud, and on the cloud one sat like the Son of Man. The living Christ is coming, having on his hand had a golden crown. Crown indicates kingly authority. Crown indicates the triumph of Jesus Christ, a golden crown, and in his hand a sharp sickle. Now what's a sickle all about? sickle you use for harvest. So this is harvest time. This is harvest time. Jesus is coming. And in Revelation chapter 14, you have two harvests. In fact, the book, whole book of Revelation is a book of contrast. You have the lamb and the dragon. You have two leaders, lamb, dragon. You have two signs, seal of God, mark of the beast. You have in Revelation two harvests, golden grain, for the garner of God and gory grapes to be tread out in his wine press. You have two cities in the book of Revelation, Jerusalem and Babylon. You have in the book of Revelation these contrasts that go through the entire book. So here you have this final harvest where Christ comes to gather the golden grain into the garner of God. You have Christ comes to redeem his people. Another angel came out of the temple crying with a loud voice to him who sat on the cloud. It's time for you to reap, so thrust in your sickle and reap, for the time has come for you to reap, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. Before the last days of earth's history, the gospel will go to the ends of the earth, and Jesus Christ will harvest the ends of the earth. See, every chapter in Revelation, when you go to chapter one, he's coming with clouds. Every eye is gonna see him. You go to the end of the seven churches in two and three, and there's judgment, and Christ comes. You go to chapters four and five, and Christ is the triumphant lamb. You go in chapter six and seven and, and eight, and at the end of the seals, Jesus comes. You go to the trumpets in there in eight and nine, and Christ comes. You go to 10, 11 and 12 and the kingdoms of this world become the kingdoms of our God. You go to Revelation 13 and 14 and there's the great harvest. Christ indeed comes again. The beast does not have the last word. Jesus Christ has the last word. That's what ancient discoveries is all about. That's what Revelation's ancient discoveries is about. The Christ who has the last final word. Revelation 16, verse 17, then the seventh angel poured out his bowl into the air. Seven last plagues. And a loud voice came out of the temple from the throne saying, it is done. It is done. It is finished. Suffering and sorrow no more. Chaos and calamity, no more. Disease and disaster, no more. Want and worry, no more. Poverty and pollution, no more. It is done, it is finished. That's the great theme of Revelation. We're gonna study Armageddon 
in this series. We're gonna study the seven last plagues. But here is the key thing. The key thing is God is gonna put an end. He's gonna put an end to sin and heartache and suffering forever and ever. Jesus is the King of kings. Jesus is the Lord of lords. Jesus will come again. Now look, friend. Somebody says, in the last days, we'll stand alone. In the last days, we may be rejected. In the last days, we may be isolated. Well, Christ knows what it's like to be rejected because he was rejected too. In everything that we will go through, Christ will be there. In everything that we will experience, Christ will experience it with us. Many of you are aware that for a number of years I worked in the former Soviet Union. And there I met many, many believers. Believers who suffered fiercely for their faith. Believers that really were crushed by the evil power of communism. They were put in isolated prisons, sent to Siberia. They suffered in the cold. They were given crusts of bread to eat. And although they were physically crushed and at times mentally faced agony and torment, their spirits soared. Why? Because the living Christ in the most oppressive times of their life was with them. And we can have the confidence that Christ will be with us in the trauma. One day the earth will shake. One day the heavens will be illuminated with the glory of God. One day the righteous dead will be resurrected. I love what it says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 16 and 17. The Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout with the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them to meet the Lord in the air. This is the great theme of the book of Revelation. Revelation 21, verse four. God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There will be no more pain, for the former things are passed away. This is the great theme of the book of Revelation. What are you going through right now? Are there tears that run down your face? Is your heart at times pierced with unusual sorrow? Have you gone through trauma in your life, maybe the trauma of a divorce? Have you known heartache and disappointment? Here is Revelation's message for you. Jesus Christ is coming. And although on this life we may live through temporary heartache, we may live through temporary sorrow, we may live through temporary suffering and pain, one day it's gonna be over. This life is like a brief interlude but eternity is coming. And that's the incredible good news. Jesus says in Revelation 1 verse five, read it together with me please. Behold, I make all things what? Behold, I make all things what? New. There's a new life for you. Jesus can give you a new peace right now. Jesus can touch your life right now. Jesus can give you a new joy for living right now. Jesus wants to come into your life fully right now because one day he will come again and take you to a land where there's no more sickness or suffering or heartache or grief. Some time ago, during the Second World War, Hitler's bombers were flying over London night after night, bombing attack after bombing attack after bombing attack. The city was aflame. The city was rumbling. And there, the bombs dropped on one home, father, mother, children. Everybody in that home was killed. Everybody except the father and his little seven-year-old daughter. They both were incredibly traumatized. 
And after that initial bombing, he took her into a bomb shelter. They went deeply beneath the earth. But there in that bomb shelter, they heard the bombs. And the earth was shaking. And the bombs were exploding. And the little girl was incredibly afraid. And she said, Daddy, hold my hand. He held her hand and said, Honey, go to sleep. She said, Daddy, I'm still afraid. Daddy, hold my hand. She said, Daddy, I can't sleep. The bombs. You hold me tight, Daddy. He held her hand. And she said, Daddy, I still cannot sleep. Daddy, turn your face toward me when you sleep. And the father rolled over, took the girl's hand, and she said, Daddy, I can sleep now because I'm looking into your face. Friend of mine, when your life is shaking, when your life is crumbling, when it seems your life is falling apart, turn your eyes upon Jesus and look full in his wonderful face. And the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Listen as Tim sings. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. And the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. Turn your eyes upon Jesus, look full in his wonderful face, and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and Thank you, Tim. Turn your eyes upon who, everybody? Turn your eyes upon Jesus and look full in his wonderful face. And the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. In the book of Revelation, that is the appeal that Christ gives to you. That's the appeal that Christ gives to me. There may be somebody watching this telecast tonight that you have never made that full, total commitment to Christ. And you may be wondering, how do I make that commitment? You may be a church member, but your religious faith may be very, very superficial. You may be a church member and prayer is no longer meaningful in your life. When you pray, it's like your prayer goes up to the ceiling and comes back. You may be a church member going to church, but it's formal, superficial religion. The Bible no longer stimulates your heart. It no longer moves your life and you spend little time studying. There is a crisis coming. And let me just open my heart to you. If you don't know Christ, no matter what's up here in your head, you're not gonna get through the coming crisis. The devil's temptations are gonna be so overwhelming. The pressure to yield your faith is gonna be so great 
The crisis that's coming is so enormous that there's absolutely no way that you can get through that crisis without a vital, living relationship with Jesus. But you're saying, Pastor, how can I have that? Jesus says, come unto me, all you that are burdened and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest for your soul. Matthew 11, verse 28 to 30. Jesus says in John chapter six, him that cometh to me, I will in no wise cast out. Christ is inviting you right now, wherever you are, to come to him. You say, what does that mean? It means making a conscious decision of your will to simply say, Christ, I am yours. I cannot save myself. Only you can save me. So Jesus, I'm coming right now. I'm, I'm simply coming. You can bow your head wherever you are. Wherever you are in the world, you can bow your head right now. If you know Christ, ask him for a much deeper relationship with Christ than you've ever had before. Tell him that superficiality is not gonna do for you. Tell him that you wanna come right now to him. If you've never accepted him before, simply say, Jesus, I believe. I believe that you lived and died for me and you can save me. I believe that in Christ all my sins are forgiven. I believe by your grace I can be a new man or new woman. Jesus, I believe. Come right now as we pray. Father in heaven, thank you so much that the book of Revelation is not a book of mystic symbols simply. It's not a book of scary beasts simply. It's not a book about end time simply. Although it is all of that, and we will study that in this Revelation's ancient discovery series, but Lord, the book of Revelation is a book about Jesus. It's a book about his glorious invitation to come and so, my Father, we come. We come right now. I'm praying for that person who's a Christian who drifted away from you. Touch them right now. Speak to them right now. Move on their heart right now. I'm praying for that person that's never made a decision for you. They've happened upon this broadcast. Move upon their life right now. Give them a sense that we're gonna face a tremendous crisis, but that Jesus can get them through that crisis. So Father, I pray for them. And I thank you, Lord, that as we go through this series, your truth will unfold and we can walk with you and live with you forever and ever and ever in Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for joining us for this Revelation's Ancient Discovery series. As we go through this series, we will go through chapter after chapter in the book of Revelation we will unfold exactly what the prophecies of Revelation teach. You will discover new truths that are life-changing and that are life-transformational. So stay with us as we journey through the book of Revelation and let Christ's peace, let Christ's joy wash over you and let the hope and thrill of the second coming of Christ Move your heart today, tomorrow, and forever. Amen.